to be in chapter 14, <clears throat> Proverbs 14, and we're going to go ahead and begin in verse 1. I know we kind of already started, but we're going to go back and take a running start. Let's pray. Father, <clears throat> we thank you for an opportunity to just study your word, and we know that your word is a foundation on which we can build our lives, and so we come tonight with teachable hearts <clears throat> and just a soul that is open before you and say, Lord, pour your soul, pour your word upon our soul that we indeed would be changed by the wisdom of God. We need the wisdom of God to be the treasure of our heart. <clears throat> and so we look to you now to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we are in these chapters where the life of the upright the life of the one who follows in the path that God would lay before us, the path of blessing, is contrasted to the foolish one, the hard-hearted one, the one that insists on going his or her own way. <clears throat> and the contrast is one after the other. And, and again, it may seem that there's uh, randomness to it because it doesn't seem to flow in an organized way, but it does because these threads of truths go through them and you see the patterns as you study it. Notice begin in verse 1, the wise woman builds her house, but the foolish one tears it down with her own hands. <clears throat> it's a great statement of encouragement for women, but frankly all, because wisdom builds, wisdom edifies, wisdom strengthens and and builds up. You know, edification is what God wants to do. Every spiritual gift is given for that reason. Because God wants his church built up. God wants the house built up. God wants the family built up. And it's a tragedy when we see people tearing down one another. What is that about? It's not about God. And so he's saying, hey, wisdom builds the house. For he who walks in his uprightness fears the Lord. That means that he reveres or respects God. It is faith that said right there. He walks in his uprightness and he fears the Lord. But he who is crooked in his ways despises God. He, he rejects the Lord. He doesn't welcome the things of the Lord. In fact, he doesn't want them at all. And then it says, in the mouth of the foolish is a rod for his back. In other words, the trouble is going to come out of his mouth and it will result in difficulties in his own life. It comes back to him as trouble. That's the point. He's warning us there. But the lips of the wise preserve him. I love verse 4. Verse 4 is underlined in my Bible because it is a great truth. It is so wonderful to help. Notice what it says. Where no oxen are, the manger is clean. But much increase comes from the strength of an ox. And we can look at that and say, man, that could apply to a lot of things. Where it says, for example, where no children are, the diapers are clean. <laughs> they don't stinketh up your house when there's no children in the house. But what would we do without children in the house? I mean, the, the love of the children and the joy of their heart just blesses our soul. And we can say over and over, we can add one thing upon the other. And here's the point. Frankly, uh, life sometimes brings difficulties with it. We're all imperfect people, and we have messy lives sometimes. Isn't that true? We're, you know, there, there's an old saying, uh, amongst pastors. Okay, I'm going to give you an insight, uh, inside saying of a pastor. Okay, you ready for this? Ministry would be easy if it wasn't for the people. <laughs> okay, but isn't it a similar truth? And so there we understand, frankly, because pastors, we got troubles ourselves. And so there we must understand a great point, which is, hey, increase comes from the strength of an ox. All right, it continues, verse 5. A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness speaks lies. And God is about truth. You know why God is about truth? Because he is truth. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth. Truth is a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. And so therefore we understand why truth matters to God, because it's who he is. Therefore, lying is a detestable thing to the Lord for that reason. And it continues, a scoffer seeks wisdom and finds none. That's because he's really not looking. 
But knowledge, I love this one here, but knowledge is easy to him who has understanding. And I was thinking about that verse, and I was reminded about when I was going to Oregon State University. And I was taking these classes, uh, you know, in math and science and, and physics and statistics and all that sort of thing. And, and uh, you know, because I had started out as a pre-med major. And the problem is with the pre-med major, I come to find out, is that you actually have to study. <laughs> and because uh, if you don't study, it doesn't really work out very well. And uh, the problem was, you know, I was, I was kind of in my newfound freedom, and my newfound independence wasn't helping me at all, <clears throat> and I wasn't studying. The thing is, I would go into those tests, those math tests or whatever, and it was so distressful. I mean... I was stressed out. And it's the absolute truth. I had nightmares for years. Literally, I had nightmares for years afterwards of sitting there taking a math test and having no idea what was before me on that test. And I was just sweating bullets, figuring out why in the world do I not understand this thing? Because I didn't want to. I didn't study them. And then what's interesting is many years later, I uh, grew up. And I got more focused in life, and I knew a calling was on my life. And so I went to Multnomah. I went to Multnomah University, what it's called now. And, and God had absolutely, wondrously, miraculously provided for me to be able to go to school. And so my, my reaction to that, my perspective on that was, God, if you have made a way for me to go to school and learn your word, I am going to give it all I got. I mean, I'm going to sit in the front row. I'm going to take notes on everything he says. I am going to be diligent in everything that I'm expected to do because, Lord, you have miraculously provided, and the best thing I can do to say thanks is to give it my all. And so I found something very interesting. I didn't have nightmares about those tests because I wanted to know that stuff. There's the difference. I wanted to understand. See, notice what it says. Knowledge is easy to him who has understanding. I want to understand it. This is, these are the words of life, man. These are the words that will change people's lives. These are the words that have the power of God unto salvation. These words are kind of important. And therefore, I want to understand. Uh, although I then took that, you know, raising kids and uh, seeing them with their homework, I so wanted them to get this great truth that understanding is the key to knowledge. Do you know what I mean by this? Understanding is the key to knowledge on all realms. And I remember seeing them with their homework and trying to convince them, now look, here's the problem. You only want the answer. Okay, you with me on this? Here's the problem. You only want the answer. The answer is not going to help you other than get the grade. It's not going to really help you. What you really need here is understanding. Understanding is the key here. And that's why he gives us a great point. Knowledge is easy to him who has understanding. Then, verse 7, leave the presence of a fool. Change of topic altogether. Leave the presence of a fool or you will not discern words of knowledge. Now, have you ever talked to somebody and realized, I'm talking to a fool here. Have you ever, come on now, has this ever happened to you? You're talking to somebody and then it dawns on, you, dawns on you, this person is absolutely wasting my time because this person has no desire at all for understanding of the Lord at all. And thereby, don't waste your time debating with someone who has no heart for it at all. I think it's a great word. Leave the presence of a fool, or you will not discern words of knowledge. Verse 8, the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. I love that phrase right there. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. We need to understand the way in which we walk, the way in which we live, we need a depth of understanding. And that's why he says it. But the folly of fools is deceit. The folly of fools is deceit. Fools mock at sin. All you got to do is listen to late night TV. Fool, okay, that's a strong word, but it's true. 
Can I have a witness here? Oh, come on. Fools mock its end, but among the upright there is goodwill. There's goodwill. There's a good heart. The favor of God goes with it. The heart knows its own bitterness. Oh, now that's an insight right there, isn't it? The heart knows its own bitterness. Oh, we know. And the thing is, you could do a study on bitterness, and you should, because it's a great study. God is so wise when he tells us to not allow a root of bitterness in our lives. Bitterness is like a bitter root. He compares, uh, let's say, you've got a well. And alongside of that well is some kind of bush or plant or whatever, and that it's a bitter plant, and it's got this root that works its way down and gets into the water. Well, that bitter root sitting there in that water is going to pretty much spoil the whole well. Because that's the point. That a bitter root will spoil the well of the soul. There cannot be streams of fresh water coming out of you when there's a bitter root soaking there in the water of the soul. And so there's a great help to us. It's a great help to us because if there is any root of bitterness, even a small one, he's saying, for your own sake, for the joy of your own life, let go of it. The heart knows its own bitterness and a stranger does not share its joy. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. Verse 12 is another great verse. I've got it underlined. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Okay, how can it be that someone can, can or there is, let's start over. How can it be that something could seem so right and be so wrong? There's the question. How could it be that something could seem right and yet be so wrong? Answer, because many people have a way of allowing themselves to be talked into things that are wrong. How do they allow themselves to be talked into it? Now, they're talking to themselves, and so therefore their own words, their own thoughts are what get them down that trail and so this is really an issue. What we need to understand is that we need to be able to confront our own thinking. I'm telling you something. This is a big point of victory. If we can understand this, we can really be victorious. Because it is in the thinking. In fact, I love the theme of the women's conference. Change your thinking, change your life. Absolutely right on. Absolutely spot on target. If we can change our thinking so that our thinking is in agreement with God's perspective on the thing, so that our thinking is in agreement with God's view of the thing, we now have victorious thinking. And the scripture says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Therefore, the streams of the thoughts that we allow will determine the victory or the defeat in our life. So how do you then do it? There's a confrontation. We see the streams of thought going through, and the scripture says, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That is spiritual warfare when we see it from the spirit perspective of victory in the soul. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I'm telling you something, it's huge. It's one of the great insights of wisdom that God would have for our lives. And then it continues. Even in laughter, the heart may be in pain. Oh, is this so right? And the end of joy may be uh, grief. He's telling us a great point here. That the depth of the soul is the key. You see, Jesus said, My joy I give to you. We need, see, I love this point even in laughter, the heart may be in pain. Because it's very similar to what we were saying earlier about the other verse there, about the heart knows its own bitterness. God wants there to be joy in the depth of the soul. That's where the streams of life flow. Let there be joy in the depth of the soul. Jesus said, I give you my joy 
I give you my peace. I give you my love. I give you my grace. And men, when those things reside in the soul, when there is peace in the soul, when there's joy in the soul, man, I'll tell you what, that's living. That is living. And that's what God wants for us. That's why he says it so wondrously. Verse 14, the backslider in heart will have his fill of his own ways. Oh man, is that ever true? The backslider in heart will have his fill of his own ways. In other words, at some point God says, you really want that? You're going to have your fill of it. Should remind us of Israel when they were complaining in the desert, remember? Oh, they complain, they complain, they whine, they complain. We, we have to eat this manna. And this, what do we do with manna after a while? There's only so many things you can do with manna. Fried manna in the morning, banana bread in the afternoon. What do you do with it? And so they got so tired of it, they grumbled and they grumbled and grumbled and said, we want meat. God says, you want meat? You're going to have meat. You're going to have so much meat, you're going to be snorting it out your nose. You read it. It's right there in the scriptures. And so quail came. There was so much quail, man. They were batting quail out of the air. Uh, you read it. I'm telling you, it's just like that. Uh, uh, a huge wind brought this, this great flock of, 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 of quail. And they were literally batting it out of the air. And they had so much meat. It, was, they were, it says, how do you snort meat out of the nose, by the way? You throw it up. They eat so much of it, they threw it up. And so there it says, the backslider will have his fill of his own ways. You'll, have, you'll be so full of it, you'll be throwing it up. And all you got to do is get drunk once, and you know exactly what I'm saying. Amen? Amen? But a good man will be satisfied with his ways. See, there, there's a great contrast. Oh, man, to be satisfied in the soul is a very different thing. The naive believes everything. God does not want us to be naive. The naive believes everything. But the prudent man considers his steps. He's thoughtful about his decisions. Is this wise? And he will even be prayerful. God, I'm about to make a decision. I want to make a decision that is wise. Help me, Lord. The prudent man considers his steps. Verse 16 follows right along. A wise man is cautious and turns away from evil. A wise man is cautious. But a fool is arrogant and careless. They, they run where angels fear to tread. They're just careless about it. Don't recognize the danger. And that's what he's giving us, a great warning, a great warning. Notice verse 17 is a great verse. Man, this is like wisdom so powerfully given to us. Verse 17, a quick-tempered man acts foolishly. Is that not right on? A quick-tempered man. There's going to be several verses here. We're going to see there's a thread runs through. God is giving us another great piece of wisdom. Don't be quick-tempered. Be slow. The scripture says God is slow to anger. We need to be slow, thoughtful. A wise man is cautious. A prudent man considers his steps. He doesn't act out of rashness of a quick temper. Because if you act in a quick temper, you're going to say something that you regret. You're going to do something that you're going to regret. You would not have done it had you been calm. You would not have said it had you thought it through. And there's the error of that way. And there's the wisdom that he's given to us right there. And it continues on. The naive inherent foolishness or folly. But the prudent are crowned with knowledge. It's a crown upon their head. They're recognized for it. It's like a reputation. They have knowledge. The evil will bow down before the good. Oh, there's a theme that runs all the way through the New Testament there. And the wicked... At the gates of the righteous. Verse 20, the poor is hated even by his neighbor, but those who love the rich are many. Now you might say there's something wrong with that. Exactly right. And thereby he answers it in the next verse. He who despises his neighbor sins, but happy is he who is gracious to the poor. God wants us to have the generous spirit of God himself. 
God is gracious. God is generous in his grace. God is generous. And he wants us to have the same perspective. Will they, in verse 22, will they not go astray who devise evil? But kindness and truth will be to those who devise good. Make good plans. Devise good things. In all labor, there is profit. Okay, here's another thing that we see. In all labor, there is profit. Work hard. We said it before. Christians ought to be the best workers a company has because they're doing it under the Lord. In all labor, there is profit. But mere talk leads only to poverty. Okay, you know what? That's great. That's wisdom. Mere talk. Are you just going to talk about it or are you going to do it? That's what he's saying. You're going to do it or are you going to talk about it? I, it was kind of interesting. I remember there was a young man in the church a number of years ago, and uh, he was in a business class in school. And he was asked to write a paper on uh, what would be the principles of success. Write down the principles of success. So he knew that I had been in business, and so he asked if he could you know, interview, interview me for this paper. And I said, absolutely great. So we sat down, and he said, okay, I'm supposed to do a paper on the principles of success. What do you think they would be? And I said, how long is your paper supposed to be? And he said, I think it's like two pages or something. I said, you don't need two pages. You need three words. You only need three words, and each of them are one syllable, and that's all you need to know. Once you know these three words, you don't need to know anything else. It's all found in three words. You're probably wondering what those three words are. Get it done. He who gets it done is the one who will be able to, in fact, see the success. It applies to so many things. Spiritually, we know that God wants us to have his word be in our heart. Do it. Do it. Get it done. We know that God wants us to spend time in his presence because the soul is ignited in the presence of God. Do it. Get it done. Do it. And there is that great principle. We know that the husband who loves his wife as Christ loves the church will be blessed. Do it. Get it done. A wife who respects her husband and honors her family is a crown unto the Lord. Yeah, do it. Get it done. But it applies even just to the daily stuff of life. You're working, you have a job, get it done. Whatever it, your project is supposed to be, get it done. And it is a great principle. I love this, it's great. In all labor there is profit, but mere talk leads to poverty. Get it done. All right, I got it off my chest. I've been wanting to say that for weeks, looking forward to that verse. The crown of the wise is their riches. In other words, wisdom produces results. Wisdom, wise people make wise decisions. But the folly of fools is foolishness. The folly of fools is foolishness. Great insight. A truthful witness saves lives, but he who speaks lies is treacherous. I love verse 26. In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence. Oh, I love that verse. That is so good. He's giving us right there the result of strong faith. All we got to do is look at some of the wonderful, uh, victorious characters of the Bible and see the strength of their faith and how it translated into the everyday stuff of their life. One of the key examples is David. David, we know David, willing to take on, of course, Goliath, the great Philistine giant. Why was he willing to do it, though he was a young man and not large in stature? Why was he willing to do it? Because he had strong confidence in the Lord. And in fact, so much strong confidence in the Lord that when he saw the, the Israelites weak in their faith, he was incensed and angry. When he heard about it, his response was, is there not a God in Israel? I will, if no one else will go, I will go. Is there not a God in Israel? 
And then, in fact, remember what he said when he went out to face the giant? There was, you know, Goliath. You come to me with, the, you know, uh, stones and a staff. Come here, boy. I'll feed you the birds. David responded, you come to me with a spear and a sword. But I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. And David then said, and I won't just feed you to the birds, I'll feed the whole army to the birds. So that, and he, I'm sure he must have turned to the, the army, so that everyone here will know that there is a God in Israel. See, faith, which is strong, is strong confidence. That kind of confidence is victorious in life. And we need that kind of confidence in the walk of our faith, the walk of this path of life. We need to know and believe. Listen, there are mockers everywhere you turn. There are mockers left and right. There are mockers on TV. There are mockers in the square. There are mockers everywhere. And we get to decide, are we going to listen to mockers? Do we want the approval of mockers or do we want the approval of God? See, there's a point where we got to decide. we got to decide. Do we want the approval of God or do we want the approval of the world? Do we want the approval of mockers? Do we want to be popular by the mockers' eyes? Or do we say, God, I want the approval of my Lord. Once we decide that, it doesn't matter what they say anymore. It only matters what God says. And that is strong confidence. And that is the way to live our lives. And then it says, I love this, and his children will have a refuge. A refuge. His children will have a refuge. Absolutely. Because the shadow of the Almighty is a refuge for any. I love the phrase, I dwell in the shadow of the Almighty under the pinions of His wings. I take my refuge. Ah, it's so good. Wonderful words. And then it says, verse 27, follows perfectly, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life or respect of the Lord. Awe of the Lord is a fountain of life. What does that mean? That one may avoid the snares of death. What does it mean, the fear of the Lord? It means this, that if we have faith, the confidence of faith, we believe that God has a bearing in our life. In other words, we are living before the presence of the Lord and He is influencing our lives. He is effecting our lives. His hand is involved in our lives and He is intricately working in ways that we cannot even see. And we know it, we believe it, we're strong in the understanding of it and therefore it tells us that the fear of the Lord, which means that we believe in all faith, that the hand of God is right with us, it is a fountain of life because it's strong confidence. <clears throat> then it says, in a multitude of people is a king's glory, but in the dearth of people is a prince's ruin. Verse 29 is a repeat of something we saw earlier. He who is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who is quick-tempered is exalting foolishness. He's only lifting up foolishness. He who is slow to anger has great understanding. Remember, it's all about understanding. Slow to anger. Slow to anger. A man who is slow to anger has good understanding. Well, what is it that he understands? He understands that a quick-tempered man or woman says things that they regret. And they want to be wise, they want to be cautious, and so they are slow-tempered. Here's the question. How, how do we get slow-tempered? How do we get slow to anger? I mean, how do we go from being angry? Uh, maybe you're an angry person. I don't know. There are some people who, who would define themselves that way. They would say, I know that I am an angry person. May we not be defined that way. But how do we change? That's the question. How do we change from being an angry person to being a person who is slow to anger? The answer is by taking the thoughts of anger captive. 
when we start to feel them arising inside, now you all know what I'm saying, there's a, start, there's a boiling steam that starts to arise inside. Sometimes it can happen pretty quick, but you know what I'm saying? There's a rising steam that comes inside the soul. Does anybody relate to what I'm saying? This rising steam starts to come up. Now when you start to feel that rising steam, that's the time to start taking every thought captive and start confronting your soul. Slow down. Back this down. Because anger will be a trouble. You need to back this down. Now you're talking to yourself. You better back this down. He who is angry always loses. Don't get angry. Be wise. Be cautious. You're speaking to your own soul. Be cautious. Be wise. Control this. Calm yourself down. Let yourself think. Be calm. Okay. Let's think this through. And now wisdom prevails. Wisdom prevails. The problem is our emotions. Emotions. Emotions, we were just talking about this at the parenting class on Sunday. I mean the marriage class. Emotions are God-given. They're wonderful. They're like, if we, if we have our emotions, God allows us to love our wives, love our husbands, to love God, to see the beauty of the sunset and say, God, you're amazing. To experience joy. I mean, these are wonderful emotional things that God gave us as a great gift. But emotions are given to us to serve us, not to master us. You, you see what I'm saying? Emotions are given to serve us, not to master us. Paul writes, I will not be mastered by anything. We cannot allow ourselves to be mastered by anger. Anger is not to be our master. Amen? So that we can be servant unto the Lord. See, he who allows anger to be his master cannot be a servant of the Lord at that moment. Because the, you can't be a servant of the Lord because the servant of the Lord listens to what the Lord is saying. And when you're angry, you're not listening to what the Lord is saying. Is this not true? And when you're angry, you're listening to what your anger is saying. We need to listen to what our Lord is saying. In order to do that, we have to have ears to hear. In order to do that, we have to have a soul that's at peace. Okay, I got off on that one. But he who is quick-tempered is exalting foolishness. A tranquil heart is life to the body. Oh, is that good or what? A tranquil heart is life to the body. That is true. That is absolutely true. Because the, consider the opposite. A distressed heart, an agitated heart, a person who goes about agitated all the time, that's not good. But a tranquil heart is life to the body. But passion, he's talking about wrongful passions, is rottenness to the bones. And then it changes topic. He who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker. An attitude towards, again, the poor. But he who is gracious to the needy honors his maker, honors God. The wicked is thrust down by his own wrongdoing. But righteousness has a refuge when he dies. Oh, is that good? See? The righteous have a refuge. That's right. It's God. Wisdom rests in the heart of the one who has understanding. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful to be true? Wisdom is resting in the heart. But in the bosom of fools it's made known. Foolishness is made known. Verse 34, again, it's so good. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Man, I wish our country would read that and know that. Righteousness exalts a nation. Now, in light of that verse, what would you say the direction of our nation is? Well, it's not going to be exalted when unrighteousness reigns. That's the word of the Lord. And all we have to do is look at Israel itself. Israel as a nation, in times of revival, man, the blessing and the favor of God. But you could just put it on a graph and see it. Whenever they were led by wicked kings, it was, it was just a cycle of just going right down towards the pit. 
But then maybe a king would come with a good heart and, and cleanse out the temple and bring back, back revival. And you could see then the blessing and the favor of God just coming right back in waves. Man, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Now, what's interesting is we know that there are principles that apply to Israel. Israel is a nation which belongs to God, and the requirements of God upon the nation of Israel are distinct. But there are principles that apply to all nations. And this is one of those principles that apply to all nations. Sin is a disgrace to any people. Then it continues. The king's favor is toward a servant who acts wisely, but his anger is toward him who acts shamefully. Chapter 15. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Okay, now he's telling us how to respond to people who are angry. All right, we've looked at our own soul. Now a great verse for us. How do we respond to other people when they're angry? Answer, give a gentle answer. It turns away wrath. It's a great word. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. It's like stirring up the hornet's nest. A gentle answer is God's heart. See, one of the things that we were, we were talking about, even at the uh, marriage class on Sunday, is that we have to decide that our character is going to be godly regardless of what anybody else does. This is really important. We have to decide that our character is going to be godly regardless of what anybody else does. Now, this is important because here's what happens. We have kind of a cultural... Um, I guess rule might be a word, uh, a cultural um, acceptance, and it goes like this. Whatever you do, I get to do too. Okay, you see, this is a kind of a cultural thing. It's like, whatever you do, I get to do too. All right, if you get angry, I get to get angry too. You get to cuss, I get to cuss. You get to stomp your feet, I get to stomp my feet. And there's kind of this cultural rule. Okay, you started it, pal. And, you know, you raise your voice, I get to raise my voice. You, you spit when you talk, I'm going to start spitting when I talk. And, and, and we have this kind of this cultural acceptance whereby we kind of, okay, you gave me license there, pal, so I'm going to do it too. The thing is, God's looking at the whole thing and says, now, wait a minute, you're mine. Now, just hold on right there, pal. You are mine. Can you just hear God saying that? No, you're my son. No, you are my daughter. And my son and my daughter don't do that. Because it's much more effective. It's much more powerful. Because those who are angry are not powerful. They're speaking out of weakness. That's why they're angry. But power is found in wisdom. And he who is able to, there's a great verse, I can't wait, to, in fact, I can't wait to get to it, so we're going to jump to it. <laughs> Chapter 16, verse 32 You might want to underline this one. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He who rules his own spirit is better than he who captures a city. I'm telling you something. That, friends, is a great verse. You could write a book on that verse right there. We're talking about some serious high spiritual truth right there. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty because anger is not strong. He who rules his own spirit. Now, is that a great insight? 
ruling your own spirit. In other words, anger is not your master. You are ruling your spirit because you have taken captive the things which defeat you. And I'm telling you something, this is a great key to spiritual victory in our lives because many people are undone. Many people are undone because they cannot rule their own spirit. Amen. Okay, where do we leave off? A gentle answer turns away wrath. Reminds me of a story. We'll finish with a story. A fellow wrote of a story when he was on a bus. This fellow, excellent shape, very muscular, been studying martial arts. Not marital arts, martial arts. And he was on the bus. And on the bus came a belligerent drunk, bothering everybody in his belligerence. This fellow was standing in the back, holding onto a pole, watching this belligerent, bear bothering everybody drunk, bothersome to a great degree. And he had decided in his heart that this man needed to be taken down. So the man bothering everybody, physically bothering people and getting closer to him, he began to calculate his move, position his body in just the right way, tensed his muscles, bent his knees slightly, ready, calculating just one, two, he's down. The man gets closer, gets closer, he's ready. Just at that moment, an, an old man steps up, comes up to the belligerent one and says, you've had a hard day, sir. What do you know of hard days? Well, I know of your things. Tell me about it. What's wrong, my friend? What's happened? Sit down, sit down, talk to me. What's happened to my friend? And he sat down together, and soon the man was telling him the troubles of his soul, listening to the old man's wisdom. And the young man stood there on the pole, realizing that the old man was far stronger than he was. A gentle answer turns away wrath. For he who tells us, is slow to anger, is better. We can say stronger than the mighty. And he who can rule his own spirit is stronger, better than he who can even capture a city. Let's pray. Father, the greatness of your words are so amazing. The insight and the power of who you are so amazing. Lord, we look at those words and all we can say is, Lord, we want more. We want more wisdom. We want to grow. We want to have a greater depth of understanding. We want to have, in fact, the understanding that he who can even reign over his own spirit is stronger than he who captures the city. Well, Lord, then we want to, we want to have that truth in our own lives. We want to understand that this wisdom that you're giving us is so amazing. It's a great treasure. It's more valuable than gold. It's more valuable than silver. It's more valuable than precious jewels. And now we can see why. And Lord, we want it. We want more of it. We want to be changed. We want the wisdom of God to reign in our lives. We do not want to be mastered by anything here. We want to be mastered by you. Master us, Lord. Teach us, direct our soul. 
We want more wisdom. Is this true? Would you just raise your hand to the Lord and say, I sure do. I sure do. I need far more wisdom. I need more. I need a gentle spirit. I need the strength of God in my life. God, we, we know you love us. And so we, we say to you, Lord, we commit our lives to following your way. We say, yes, God, yes, God, yes, God. We invite you into our hearts. We invite you into our soul. We invite you to fill and overflow because we need your life. We need the words of life. We need your peace. We need your joy. Lord, we invite you into the very center of it all. In Jesus' name, and everyone says,